Yes, now we'll be moving on to our, our last speaker of the course, and we're going to be focusing on one of the technologies Brett did not talk about, which is entry, descent, and landing. And for that presentation, we are very lucky to have Michelle Monk, who is NASA's Entry, Descent, and Landing Systems Capability Leader since May 2017, and the Principal Technologist for, I'll now say, EDL, within the Space Technology Mission Directorate since 2013. Uh, she's currently on detail to NASA headquarters where she is responsible for ensuring the sustainment of NASA's EDL skills, facilities, and tools, as well as guiding the directorate's technical content in EDL. Um, we're so excited to have you with us today to speak about the state of the art for EDL technologies. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I am going to share here. All right, so first we'll begin with a, a little description of what is entry, descent, and landing. And obviously, maybe it's the process of delivering a vehicle from the top of the atmosphere to the surface and landing safely. Um, we most recently did this with uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Um, that was an awesome day for EDL. And um, when Perseverance got to Mars uh, at the top of the atmosphere, it was going about 13,000 miles an hour, and we had to slow to zero in just seven minutes, called the seven minutes of terror, and in about 125 kilometers of vertical distance. So um, quite a dynamic event. Um, there are three phases of the flight that we think about. Um, entry is really uh, the hypersonic part of the flight from about Mach 25 or 30 um, down to about Mach 5, and that's when, um, at least on our larger, mo more capable uh, vehicles, we are actively guiding to our target, um, managing our energy. That's when we go through our high heat pulse and our high dynamic pressure. Um, then it's followed by descent, and um, usually that's the supersonic part of the flight from about Mach 5 down through um, the transition uh, through uh, Mach 1. And that's when we usually uh, deploy our parachute and turn on our engines. And then during landing, the subsonic part of the flight, we're really getting ready to do that touchdown on the surface. So in the case of Perseverance, um, through descent and landing, we were using some new systems to make sure we landed safely and um, more precisely than ever before. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And as you might expect, you know, at least from my perspective, EDL is the riskiest part of Mars exploration. Um, and uh, we're constantly uh, working to make it better. So why is landing on Mars so hard? Um, first of all, the atmosphere, as many of you know, is about one one hundredth of the density of Earth's atmosphere. So one of my colleagues likes to say, you know, there's um, not enough atmosphere to be useful and too much to ignore. That's kind of where we are with Mars. Um, it's about half the size of the Earth and one third of the mass. And so the gravity, of course, is different. It's about three eighths of the Earth's gravity. It's far away. So we have this um, lag in our communication time. Um, so actually, when we are entering uh, the Mars atmosphere, our vehicle, um, Mars 2020, was already on the surface when we got that first indication that we were touching the atmosphere because it took 11 minutes to get signals back from uh, the planet at that point. And it's cold. It's a lot uh, farther, about 1.5 times uh, as far from the sun as the Earth, and so that makes the uh, thermal environment quite challenging. So let's look at Mars landed missions so far. Um, First, we had our successes with Viking 1 and 2 back in the 1970s when I was a little girl. And um, NASA Langley uh, actually managed those missions. And those were uh, really great successes and proved that we could land successfully on Mars. Um, then we had a long dry spell while the agency concentrated on things like space shuttle and then station. Um, but finally, in 1996, we launched uh, the Mars Pathfinder with a little Sojourner rover. And, um, you know, that was a milestone, a significant milestone of being able to rove around on the surface for the first time. But that path, uh, Sojourner rover was only about the size of a cigar box. And so um, we've come so far now um, landing rovers that are the size of golf carts or Mini Coopers. 
Um, then we had Spirit and Opportunity in 2004, and those were the twin rovers. Uh, we'll look at all these landing systems in a little more detail, um, but again, more capable rovers. Um, those, uh, all the missions uh, to date um, to Spirit and Opportunity were powered by solar um, power. So they have solar arrays collecting sunlight and recharging their batteries. Um, and uh, then finally, as our rovers got bigger and we went to MSL, Mars Science Laboratory, uh, we had a nuclear power source, which um, allows us to um, last a lot longer and not be dependent on this, those solar arrays. Um, in 2008, we sent Phoenix, which was again, another stationary lander, uh, much like Viking. Um, and then of course, Mars Science Laboratory, which was the first you know, really large rover um, first use of that sky crane um, system, and we'll talk about why. Um, then InSight, another stationary lander, and of course, Perseverance. So what's new about Perseverance EDL? Um, we have a more precise landing than we've ever had before. Um, there are really two things that uh, combine two technologies. One is um, quite uh, easy to implement, I guess, and that was the range trigger on the parachute. So for the first time, we deployed the parachute with the knowledge of how far we had to go to our landing site, as opposed to simply um, a, a dynamic pressure of the atmosphere or um, an altitude of the vehicle. Um, the most significant uh, thing that we had on board that reduced the size of that landing footprint and made us um, enable a safe landing was called terrain relative navigation. And this is a huge step forward for precision landing systems um, that we hope to also use at the moon. Um, but really, uh, the, the uh, Perseverance rover had a stored map on board that was uh, made from images taken from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the high-rise camera. And the it was taking uh, images all the way down to the surface, um, live images, and comparing those to that onboard stored map. And it was uh, picking out landmarks so that it could, within its already defined landing area that was possible, um, picking out a safe spot. And luckily, that system worked flawlessly. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to be able to apply that at other destinations. And then um, the other exciting thing I'm sure everybody has seen in the media is that we had so many more cameras um, on the vehicle during entry, descent, and landing than we've ever had before. And so um, on our back shell, we had three parachute upload cameras that gave us a great view um, of that parachute deploying because parachutes are tricky beasts and we always like to learn more about um, their operation and use that in future missions. Um, on the descent stage, we had um, on really the sky crane, which we call the descent stage, we had cameras looking down at the rover so you could actually see the rover being lowered, which was um, a really spectacular new view we got. And then on the rover, we had upload cameras looking at the descent stage. So um, I hope you've gotten a chance to see that video um, from those cameras. And then of course, we had uh, cameras looking down from the rover onto the surface, both for terrain relative navigation and just for general um, viewing. Um, a little bit more about the footprint. Uh, this is uh, the landing ellipses or footprints from Mars Pathfinder, InSight, Curiosity, and Perseverance all sort of superimposed on Jezero Crater where Mars 2020 landed. And you can see how um, much better our landing precision has gotten over these missions. Um, so in Mars Pathfinder, you know, we were about 200 kilometers long by 70 kilometers wide. This was all driven by um, the fact that our, we were not guiding the vehicle during the hypersonic portion of the flight. We had the parachute and then we had airbags that we bounced on um, pretty randomly. And so um, Curiosity really shrunk the footprint, as you can see, into more uh, like a circle from a very large ellipse, and that's all a function of that hypersonic guidance um, that we were able to implement. 
So what's the next step in uh, Mars exploration? Uh, the next step is bringing back all those great samples that Perseverance is going to cache on board and uh, actually put on the surface um, for being picked up by a later mission. So the Mars Sample Return mission is actually uh, a series of a few vehicles. Um, so I'll start here kind of in the middle on the Earth and we have um, a vehicle that looks much like um, in the outer mold line, uh, Perseverance with its crew stage, it lands, but this is actually a stationary rover with a rocket or Mars ascent vehicle on it. And you can see an artist rendition of that in the upper right hand corner here. So um, the uh, rover, excuse me, the lander also has a rover on it that um, is going to retrieve the samples, load them into the nose of the rocket, the rocket will then launch. It will rendezvous with an orbiter that has a sample return capsule on it. And then uh, a few days out from the Earth, that capsule will um, depart from the return orbiter and land passively in Utah. And you see a, a picture of a, a test of that system here in the bottom right. So um, some of the challenges here are really um, I, what we'd call them as pinpoint landing to get as close to those um, cache samples as possible um, to reduce the amount of roving that we need to do and the amount of time on the surface. And then um, a much heavier uh, lander than uh, Perseverance uh, was even. Uh, with the rocket and the rover on it, this is a much larger vehicle. Um, as Brett mentioned, he set me up very well. Um, we can't test these systems end to end on Earth. One of the difficulties is because of that atmospheric density difference that I mentioned, um, to get an equivalent density at Earth, we'd have to be at about 100,000 feet, and it's difficult to test at 100,000 feet. Um, but we uh, simulate all of the vehicle um, subsystems and characteristics as well as the environment in a simulation and that simulation is actually um, put together at NASA Langley and that is a key component of the, um, the JPL uh, mission team. And so um, we have the mass properties of the vehicle, we have the aerodynamics and aerothermodynamics, um, the flight software, um, all the engine models, um, the inertial measurement unit, the parachute, et cetera, the atmosphere, and that all comes together um, in this core model. And this, this model is really developed um, from day one. So um, the folks who have been working on the vehicle and the model are working hand in hand from, you know, for many years. And so as the vehicle definition grows, um, so does the complexity and uh, fidelity of the simulation. And then um, those landing ellipses that I showed you are really um, developed through uh, running what we call Monte Carlo simulation. So we use statistics of all the uncertainties in these various components of the atmosphere, um, the environment, and the vehicle, and we run the simulation hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times, um, to be sure that we understand the landing area and that the uh, vehicle is going to behave the way we want it to and land successfully. Um, so since we can't test end to end, we test the different components um, as much as possible on Earth uh, through things like drop tests and wind tunnels and arc jets, um, all kinds of different uh, types of testing that we use. Um, that go into the models and then come together into the simulation. Uh, let me talk for a moment about a traditional heat shield system. Um, here I've got an outer mold line, what we call the outer shape of the vehicle. And uh, so this is the fore body heat shield here, and then the aft body, uh, which kind of covers the rover. And um, that's made up of a composite aeroshell structure, so it has um, composite face sheets and an aluminum honeycomb core usually. Um, that makes it very light yet stiff to take the loads of uh, launch as well as entry. And then on the front of that, um, through uh, by an adhesive layer, is a thermal protection system material. 
Um, for Marsh Science Laboratory and Perseverance, we used a uh, material called PICA, phenolic impregnated carbon ablator, that was first proven out on the Stardust sample return mission. Um, and uh, prior to that, for some of the smaller uh, Mars vehicles, actually every other lander had used um, a Lockheed Martin material called SLA-561V. Um, and then on the back shell, we also, um, for Perseverance, we have SLA-561V, um, as well as a composite, a stiff structure again. Um, one of the things we've uh, tried to do with our recent missions is actually learn how the system performed, the aeroshell system performed. Um, because we as engineers uh, want to know how we did. Were we on the hairy edge of a failure or did we way over design the system so that we could have made it much lighter? So one of our uh, key initiatives has been to start to instrument these entry systems. And uh, we did that on uh, Perseverance as well as Mars Science Laboratory. On the heat shield for uh, Mars 2020, we had 17 instrumented thermal plugs, which are um, thermocouples embedded in the heat shield material, telling us how the heat is soaking through that material as we progress through the entry. Um, we were also uh, measuring the pressure on the uh, four-body aeroshell um, to get an independent uh, measure of the density of the atmosphere. So um, that's a key component of reconstructing uh, the flight path. Uh, we also were able to, for the first time on Mars 2020, put uh, sensors in the back shell. So we um, directly sensed the uh, heating on the surface of the vehicle with heat flux sensors. We had a pressure transducer as well as these embedded uh, thermal plugs to understand the heat soak. Um, all of this was um, manufactured at NASA Langley and NASA Ames. Um, and sent all their data to a computer, which sent its data to the rover. So we didn't get our full data set back until uh, Perseverance was safely on the surface. Um, but our data looks fantastic and engineers are pouring over it, um, even as we speak to try to make um, the sample retrieval lander for MSR even better. So what do these uh, landers look like uh, in comparison to each other? So here I have um, all of the um, Mars landers that we've uh, successfully landed so far. And you can see that they um, have some things in common. They all look the same in the front and they all look pretty similar in the back with a couple differences. Um, we have some uh, cone shaped uh, aft bodies and we have some um, multiple conic shaped aft bodies. And that's really just a function of uh, what we're packaging inside that aeroshell. Um, you can see that all their diameters range from about two and a half to four and a half meters. And that is um, limited by the saw size of the launch vehicle that we're sending them in. Um, the uh, largest mass that we've uh, sent for entry has been Perseverance at 3.4 tons. Um, but uh, Pathfinder was only a little over half a ton. All of them have used a supersonic parachute. They've all landed um, actually kind of below sea level, which we call um, MOLA. So that's kind of the zero altitude on Mars. Uh, the reason why is because uh, we need all that extra distance to slow down our vehicle. Remember, we've got a very thin atmosphere, and so the longer we can take before we're gonna hit the surface, the better. Um, so one of the things we'd like to improve in the future is actually being able to access higher altitude landing sites. And then uh, we've used a, a number of different approaches for um, terminal descent and landing. So we've used uh, retro propulsion on the landers, um, uh, thrusters underneath, uh, we've used airbags on Pathfinder and MER, and as Brett mentioned, you know, airbags are really limited um, in the amount of mass they can deliver. So probably can't go much bigger than an MER delivered mass with an airbag system. And then, of course, for our very large rovers, uh, we've used the sky crane. But uh, these, you know, uh, rovers that we've landed on the surface are up to about one metric ton. Um, but 
the Viking heritage technology really breaks um, somewhere between two and four metric tons. Uh, we haven't done all the work to pinpoint exactly where that, uh, that breaks, but what are we gonna do for the future? We're gonna have to um, have a, a very big vehicle um, to take humans. So when we land humans on Mars, we're gonna have to land not a Mini Cooper, but the equivalent of a two-story house. So um, that vehicle would be about 20 metric tons landed as opposed to our one metric ton. Uh, rover, and that makes the entry um, mass about 50 metric tons. So we're going to have to have a large aeroshell to slow down this vehicle in the thin Mars atmosphere. Parachutes are not going to be effective, and so uh, we need to start turning on our landing engines while we're still in the supersonic flight regime. Um, I mentioned about the landing site altitude, and this is a, a plot on a um, topographic map of where all of our successful landings have been so far and you can see that they're all kind of in the green or blue area of this map uh, with yellow and red being the higher altitudes and so we call this the southern highlands and um, if there's interesting science to be done there we might need to beef up our uh, EDL systems. I talked about the uh, air shell being constrained to the launch shroud diameter, um, but if we want to land that big human mission or even a five or ten ton payload on Mars to take a lot of science, we're going to need a bigger heat shield. Uh, one way to do that is to make an inflatable heat shield, something that is stowed in the launch vehicle and then expands um, before it has to take the high heat and load of the Mars atmosphere. Um, that's exactly what uh, we've been working on at NASA Langley. Um, some engineers there have developed this um, idea of an inflatable heat shield. It's a number of stacked toroids for the structure um, that are all held together by straps and stiffened by um, an, a kind of a backside um, donut or torus. And then it has a flexible thermal protection system that can be folded up um, during launch and then um, expands to cover and protect this uh, structure during entry. And it's multi-layered um, and you can tailor it to different heat rates and heat loads um, by changing the outer layer and the insulation. We've actually flight tested that um, at the three meter scale twice and it will be flight tested on a return from Earth orbit in 2022 where it will get Mars relevant heating um, loads so that we can see how it behaves. So I guess the question now is what does the future look like? Um, I don't see anything really on the Mars manifest in terms of missions that have been designed um, past the Mars sample return mission. And so I think the future is really wide open and so what we want to address in our workshop is um, what is that going to look like? So could these be small science-focused missions um, using helicopters, airplanes, um, tumblers, microprobes, CubeSats, um, exobrakes, or I should have put puffer on here as well. Um, that's Those are some possibilities that might be cost-effective and allow us to um, go more rapidly, more uh, cost-effectively and more often uh, to the Mars surface? Or does our future look like something that's very large and human forward with an inflatable aeroshell or some other concept like that of the SpaceX Starship um, that comes in and lands multiple metric tons on the, uh, on the surface of Mars um, supporting surface excavation or in placing a power plant uh, for future human uh, sustainability. So in summary, the Mars landers have increased in size and complexity over the past 50 years, but right now we're really limited by that Viking era technology. Um, we have some challenges for Mars sample return and beyond. If we wanna send more mass, uh, we wanna get more precise landings so that we can land payloads next to each other, particularly to support human sustainability. 
um, higher altitude terrain so that we can have global coverage and not be limited by certain locations on the surface. And then if we want to do really interesting science and have access to hazardous locations, as Brett talked about, there are many different types of mobility systems that could be employed, but can we get them there? Um, we want new EDL systems, uh, and we're going to need those for landing humans and their cargo. And numerous payload options exist for delivering uh, the science things that we want to send, meeting those, uh, filling those strategic knowledge gaps that Dan, uh, excuse me, Don talked about earlier. Uh, planetary CubeSats are becoming more prominent, and so we could see a landscape that really shifts in that direction in the future. And maybe new delivery methods are worth consideration. Um, I didn't talk much about um, other aero assist maneuvers that could be done besides just a direct entry. We could look at aero capturing into orbit, using the atmosphere for plane changes to put down those uh, swarms of vehicles that we heard about. So the possibilities are really endless. So with that, I'll uh, close and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, so I'll go ahead and ask through them. The first one is going back to Perseverance TRN and wondering how many solutions did the TRN generate, how it selected the one it used? Was it just the first one that closed or were there several that it ranked? Um, Barbara, I really appreciate that question, and um, I'm going to have to leave that to the TRN experts. Um, I, I heard it's a very small number, but I don't want to misquote. Um, I believe it was less than 10, fewer than 10 um, uh, images that were taken of the surface before we got a convergence. So um, the algorithms worked uh, beautifully, um, but I probably I uh, can't give you much more uh, definitive answer than that uh, at this point. All right, the next question, was the range trigger on Mars 2020 also accounting for the atmospheric conditions that the parachute would deploy into? Well, all of our parachutes are really um, designed to be within that um, Viking parachute uh, limits uh, that were set by that uh, qualification program back in the 1960s and 70s. And so um, we were still deploying within that uh, Viking parachute box, uh, which is um, a maximum Mach number of 2.2. And there's a maximum dynamic, dynamic pressure as well somewhere around um, 1,000 uh, pascals, I believe. Um, and don't quote me on that one. <laughs> uh, the Mach number is really what we uh, usually uh, pay attention to and what limits us um, for uh, our Mars parachutes. So we were within that box, yes. All right, the next question. Any comment on the role of the hazard detection and avoidance for terminal descent? Um, a note that we have not incorporated that capability to date, although it might be tested soon. It does appear the Chinese lunar lander has utilized it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are uh, investing in hazard detection technologies um, through the Space Technology Mission Directorate and probably um, on the commercial side as well as we get ready, as you say, for lunar landings. Um, you know, you probably don't need it to land in the Mare regions, but at the South Pole, uh, it could be quite challenging uh, to land in those lighting conditions um, near a crater. So um, hazard detection will absolutely be necessary for any destinations where we don't have uh, high resolution maps. And so it will be kind of on a case by case basis, depending on how large your lander is um, and how robust it is to those landing hazards versus uh, what type of uh, map resolutions you have. So, um, you know, we're finding at the moon that optical terrain relative navigation may not be a robust enough solution for landing at the South Pole just because of the lighting conditions. And so we're looking uh, now at active terrain relative navigation as well. Um, you can imagine that for Europa, 
Uh, we don't have high resolution maps of that very um, hazardous surface. And if we did take pictures, um, the surface may change um, until, you know, before we sent a landing mission. So in those cases, hazard detection is going to be absolutely essential. Super cool. I'll also note there is uh, Tim Crane commented that they are going to demonstrate uh, hazard detection at the moon on one ILM, I, sorry, IM1. Um, I don't actually, I'm not familiar with that mission. That's Intuitive Machines 1. Intuitive Machines, that's what it stands for. Fabulous. Okay, um, another question about what about going smaller and can retro propulsion be scaled down to smaller systems? Retro propulsion can be scaled down. However, it's probably not your most mass efficient um, solution. So um, that's why we've used inflatable decelerators, parachutes for so long, because they are mass efficient. Um, and that's what makes the inflatable heat shield so compelling is that it's about a 15% mass fraction uh, to the payload as opposed to um, some other systems that you know, have large rigid aero shells. So um, it's all about mass, as uh, Brett uh, explained earlier. And, um, you know, the retro propulsion, if we had a better way to do it uh, for landing a large payload, like a human scale payload, we would. Um, but there's just not an inflatable decelerator that can uh, handle that size and mass. All right. Um, the next question is about the sensors. How do you know where and how many sensors you want to locate on the body, i.e. on the aero shell, to get the maximum data return? And then what data are the most interesting to look for to understand that the system is over-designed? Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, thank you, because I, as part of my passion, is um, instrumenting these heat shields. So. Um, uh, how do we decide where to put the sensors? Um, so first we um, choose the types of sensors to fill our knowledge gaps, again, in what we understand about the engineering environment. So for instance, on Mars Science Laboratory, we had um, seven hypersonic pressure sensors. Um, and we said, okay, well, we kind of understand hypersonic pressure pretty well. This time, let's put more sensors that are tuned to the supersonic flight regime because that's where our aerodynamics really matter and we get more effects on our back shell and it's harder to predict um, and we don't understand as much. So first, we identify the biggest gaps in our knowledge. Second, we do predictions with our current aerodynamic and aerothermodynamic tools and we place our sensors in regions that will give us the most coverage or um, give us feedback on interesting features like when the flow field transitions to turbulence um, on the aero shell. Um, and then the back shell has been an area that we've largely ignored and we have not great predictions back there because you're dealing with separated flow that's unsteady as it comes around from the forebody and that's really hard to simulate and predict. So. It was really important to us to get those back shell sensors. Um, in addition, we found that um, CO2 radiation on the back shell is really a significant contributor to the heating. Um, and if you can uh, reduce the uncertainties in the back shell heating, you can reduce that thermal protection system thickness on the back. And that not only saves you mass, but that also moves your mass forward um, to, uh, to the nose of the vehicle, making it more stable. So that back shell is really critical um, to understand. Um, and if you, you know, notice the picture of the inflatable heat shield, um, it has no back shell. So if we could understand that environment well enough to eliminate that back shell, it would save a lot of mass in the future. Uh, the most exciting data um, I think is the new back shell data because we haven't seen it before. So new types of curves to look at. Great. Okay, um, we have time for one last question. And that is, uh, why do human landing systems have to be so big? Why can't you just do a bunch of small ones instead? That's an awesome question too. Um, you probably could uh, break some things into smaller pieces. Um, but if you 
have a minimum crew size of, you know, two or three or four, depending on what you think that minimum crew size should be. Um, and you have a minimum stay time. So, you know, is it worth traveling six months out to stay on the surface for a week or a month? Or, you know, do you want to stay longer? So, you know, once you trade all that in your mind, really the indivisible piece that, um, that sizes your uh, minimum lander or your maximum lander is really the ascent vehicle. So um, that rocket that's going to take the astronauts from the surface back into orbit to rendezvous with their return vehicle is really the, the one piece that you can't break apart. You've got to um, deliver that all together. Um, and we've decided over the years that, you know, it needs to be fueled uh, before you put the people in it, uh, actually before the people leave the Earth. So you can either make that propellant on the surface through in situ resource utilization and make sure that all that propellant has been manufactured, loaded into the ascent vehicle before your humans leave Earth, or you have to land a fully fueled ascent vehicle. Um, and uh, you don't want to, you know, rely on having to plumb all that up when you get there. You kind of want it as one unit um, for risk reduction. Super cool. I'm laughing. Chad Edwards suggests how about smaller astronauts? <laughs> don't think that's going to solve the problem. Oh, <laughs> you've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We used to talk Thank about you. Two naked crew on a blob of propellant. That is the <laughs> minimum thing that you need to send to Mars. <laughs> yes, it doesn't sound so great. <laughs> awesome, wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you once again to all of our speakers. Um, I've certainly learned a lot today. Hopefully you all have too. I'm super excited to get together with a group of us next week for this workshop uh, to talk about more details about how we can revolutionize revolutionize our access to the Martian surface. 